people through our chapters. If you, um, <laughs> if you see something online through the Chronicle of Philanthropy and you want to do it, but it costs money and you don't have that in your organization's budget, we can help you with that. Um, so please just let us know. And then um, Alba Rojas Sukar with Arizona Oncology is organizing that. So reach out to Alba if you need anything. And then I am super excited today. We have Queer for Good, Advancing LGBTQ Plus Equity in Arizona Through Philanthropy. And I'm gonna introduce our moderator and then I'll let Andres introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, Andres Cano is the director of LGBTQ Plus Alliance Fund, where he oversees the fund's donor development efforts and external relations. Andres is also a current member of the Arizona House of Representatives. Andres, thank you for serving our community and welcome. Well, thank you, Sarah, and to all of you, good morning, happy Friday. I hope you have gotten your coffee in and we're looking forward to the next conversation in the next hour. Uh, for those of you I, who I've not had the opportunity to meet, my name is Andres and I have the honor of serving as the first director of the LGBTQ Alliance Fund, which is housed at the Community Foundation for Southern Arizona. We have an incredible panel today of folks who have been in the trenches for many decades. And I think what I wanted uh, really from this conversation is open dialogue, uh, shared best practices and uh, we're looking forward to the conversation. And what I stressed to Ori um, at the beginning of all of this is, is that today is, is about uplifting uh, our regional queer voices, using your expertise as philanthropic uh, professionals uh, to be able to say, let you know that we're here, but we're also uh, here as a regional catalyst for change. Uh, our uh, board chair is with us uh, and is one of our panelists. I'll let him explain a little bit more about the Alliance Fund and what we do. Uh, but ultimately, I, I will kind of go in between the uh, new panel to be able to say, um, or with the panelists, I think ultimately what we've got to do is introduce our folks, we'll have our presentations, and then we'll be able to uh, have any questions answered at the very end. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, allow our uh, panelists to introduce themselves first, uh, and then we'll go over the organizational uh, overviews and folks can tell you specifically about their expertise, but we uh, will kick it off first to uh, Kent Burbank, uh, who will introduce himself, tell us about what uh, the most exciting thing you're looking forward to uh, and the return to the new normal uh, to kind of break us off as an icebreaker. Good, all right. So um, I'm Kent Burbank and uh, I have been in Tucson about 20 years. Um, I, as Andres mentioned, is, am currently the chair of the LGBTQ Alliance Fund um, where I've been a donor since almost since its inception about 22 uh, years ago um, and have been involved in the queer community in Tucson um, for the last 20 years, um, including serving um, as the director of Wingspan when it was around um, and many of the programs there. And what I'm excited about is because I teach now, I teach social work, I can't wait to get back into the classroom and be in front of my students instead of doing this. So, all right, I'll let somebody else, is Michael or Levina, go next. Uh, sure, let's choose Levina and Kent. We're excited for your students too. I've talked to a lot of educators who are nervous about the black screens that were prevalent on Zoom and uh, Kent, fun fact actually requires if you're taking his class to turn on the cameras. <laughs> uh, Levina, at new normal, welcome to the panel. We're so excited to have you in Southern Arizona, Senior Pride be a part of today's discussion. Uh, I think you're on mute. I got me... it. I got it. Ah. Oh, good morning, everyone. It's great to see all of you. And I see a lot of friendly faces here, people that I know, and uh, wonderful smiles. Um, Southern Arizona Senior Pride uh, began as a funded program at Wingspan in 2002. And um, after Wingspan closed in 2014, concerned community members came together and um, really worked to keep a senior pride alive. We engaged Southern Arizona AIDS Foundation as our fiscal uh, agent. 
or sponsor. And um, in the past seven years, volunteers have worked hard, really hard to sustain and grow our services and uh, strengthen our infrastructure. Our mission is to celebrate, support, and unite LGBTQI plus older adults. Uh, we're the only organization run by and for LGBTQI older adults. And um, our services are available to people 55 and older and people with disabilities. Many aging concerns in our community are universal. But what is unique? Our traumatic and activist history, our culture, continued uncertainty of services and care, long-term stress of being discriminated against, invisibility in closets, and remarkable resilience. In Tucson, um, LGBTQI plus aging issues include homelessness and safe, welcoming, affordable housing, food and economic insecurity, welcoming, continuing care communities, caregiving um, assistance and support, quality health care, transportation, isolation compounded by aging, changing capacities for independent living, a sense of purpose and meaning and celebration of our history and culture. Senior Pride meets only some of these needs. Pima Council on Aging is welcoming and provides significant services. We are currently concerned about housing, uh, continuing care communities, support for caregivers, and um, economic insecurity. Thank you. And Lavina, I'm so sorry to interrupt. We're just doing introductions right now. Oh and my so God, I did we, my we whole will... talk. <laughs> and so that is totally I, fine. I'm done. Um, <laughs> but those are three pressing issues. And I think that's going to be the emphasis really of the conversation is that need exists. So we will come right back to you, Lavina. I so promise. Um, and uh, our other star panelist is Michael Soto, who I'm so grateful. Uh, accepted the invitation to join this conversation. And Michael, can you please introduce yourself a little bit and tell us about Equality Arizona? And then I promise we will allow each person to go a little bit into the expanded conversation. Absolutely, thank you, Andres. Um, my name is Michael Soto and I'm the Executive Director of Equality Arizona. And Equality Arizona is the statewide um, advocacy group for LGBTQ people um, of every kind. So um, it's our job to represent the, the entire LGBTQ community at the legislature, at cities and towns, with the federal government, um, in any advocacy capacity. Um, and we do our best to help to build the voting power and the civic power of LGBTQ people um, every, all year, every year, um, and hopefully help people get engaged in the civic process. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, and I am so grateful for the advocacy that you're providing. I think our work goes hand in hand. Uh, and we are going to uh, go back uh, to Kent, who uh, has prepared a, a very brief slideshow to kind of go over a little bit about the Alliance Fund uh, as the convener for change, ultimately, in a lot of this. And uh, he has it right up. Okay, Kent. All right, um, so um, this will be brief, I promise. <laughs> I'm not going to uh, PowerPoint you to death here. Um, so um, it is great to be here, and we're very excited at the Alliance Fund uh, about this conversation because it's really important that we talk in philanthropy. As a past member of AFP, when I was involved at Wingspan, I was very involved with AFP at that time. You know, when in, in philanthropy, we need to be having these conversations about um, issues around equity and where, where dollars flow and how we are serving underserved uh, communities. So thank you. Thank you for creating the space um, at AFP to have this conversation. I also want to take just one second to recognize that we've had hate crimes in this community against the uh, Jewish community in the last week. Um, and it's really important, I think, for marginalized communities, communities that have experienced oppression, to make sure that we are recognizing that um, those that attack one typically are the same groups that attack all of us, um, and that there's clear intersectionality, right? So um, 
we have many members of the queer community who are Jewish and vice versa. And so I, I just wanna kind of create that space of recognizing the impact that hate crimes have psychologically on communities. And so, um, uh, so my heart goes out um, you know, to the Jewish community. Um, all right, so, um, so the Alliance Fund, real quick, um, our mission really is um, that we are trying to engage the community through philanthropy um, to support LGBTQ programs um, in Southern Arizona. We want to increase the capacity of this community to serve LGBTQ plus people. Um, and so thank you again for having this conversation. We are thrilled that this is uh, the year in which we surpassed um, in our 22 year history, we just surpassed a million dollars, um, which for us is huge. For many organizations, this will feel like a drop in the bucket, but when you are a small, uh, historically all volunteer, and now with our first director organization, we're excited about the momentum we're building and what we're gonna be able to do in the future. Um, and I'm really hoping that we hit the next million in about half this time or less, maybe maybe even more. Right, Andres? <laughs> All right, so our current focus areas, although this may shift as we um, enter into some strategic conversations with the board, have been around um, youth and elder issues, recognizing the vulnerabilities in those populations, um, <clears throat> community building and collaborations, transgender issues, again, there's tremendous vulnerability in the trans community. And we, um, about two years ago, expanded to do, <coughs> excuse me, general operating support for those organizations that have kind of a, a specific LGBT focus. Um, so um, we also are having a lot of conversations that are board right now around other equity issues um, regarding people of color communities, BIPOC communities. So um, I would not be surprised if that um, becomes a, an increasing area of focus of the Alliance Fund um, going forward. So um, we were celebrating uh, Brenda and Rio, but we have lots of other grantees um, this, uh, that were just announced about a week ago. Um, and so we are thrilled with our current 2001-2002 grantee list, and uh, we will be celebrating them in the fall at our annual event. So um, nationwide, so flipping to kind of talk about this big picture, right? Um, about $200 million is what gets invested in LGBTQ issues in the United States. So when you hear that, it sounds like a lot of money, right? Um, but when we look at where this fits within overall philanthropy, literally 28 cents, specifically of every $100 of philanthropy, specifically sports LGBTQ causes. It's a tiny, tiny drop of the bucket. We have a significant issue in this in the United States where phil philanthropic dollars are not reaching some of our most marginalized communities. Um, and it is something that some of the big foundations are starting to look at and address, and this has been improving over years, but it is nowhere near where it needs to be if we're really going to address the disparities. Um, so specifically, when we drill down, we have issues around people of color communities um, that go even deeper. So when we look at Black LGBTQ individuals or Latinx LGBTQ, um, we see higher rates of child poverty um, in those uh, couples. Black trans folks, alarming rates of violence, right? Um, and then when we look at the funding, there's only about 5% of the funding that goes to the queer community hits the uh, African-American LGBTQ community. Likewise, it's even worse in the Latinx community in terms of it's only about 3% of, of those uh, dollars from philanthropy flowing to the queer community are actually um, specifically targeting the Latinx community. Even though we see higher rates of in, uh, food insecurity, um, higher rates of being uninsured, um, as Brenda and others would know, right? So in the in uh, the Southwest here, you know, we know that roughly about 5% of adults some um, identify as LGBTQ, right? That means about 5% of any workforce is LGBTQ. Um, um, so it is, a, it is a small but yet significant portion of our population. Um, and again, here in the Southwest, we're looking at somewhere around four to seven million dollars annually of dollars flowing into these um, four or five states. So 
When you look at Arizona, it means that the Tiny Alliance Fund, right, as well as um, our counterparts um, in Phoenix, really are, are making a significant contribution with a very small amount of dollars. Okay, so we are a key player, um, um, even though we don't have the obviously the financial resources as some of some of these other foundations that are on uh, this list. So what we are looking for for the future is um, we are I I cannot tell you how ecstatic we are to have Andres Cano as our director um, because it really means that we're able to do things that we have not been able to do in the past. And one of um, the things that Andres is really good at is connecting people and connecting communities. And so we are delighted that one of our focus areas is really gonna be about building and sprinkling partnerships and collaborations. And there is nobody better suited to do that work um, than Andres. And so we are delighted um, uh, to have him as our leader. And we are really looking forward to expanding our capacity so that we can increase our grant making. All right, that's my snapshot. I'm gonna stop you, sharing. That was fantastic, thank you. And uh, Elise, Fred, Julie, and Julie, welcome. I will be going through uh, very quick welcomes throughout the portion of this panel uh, because this is a shared space and we're so lucky to have you this Friday morning. Uh, what Kent was very, very humble about is the fact that he actually has been around since the very earliest days of the Alliance Fund in 1999 when there was a national call to action of uh, really philanthropic organizations, community foundations who said we've got to invest in uh, the LGBT community and specifically put those long-term planning and those resources uh, into a, a plan that'll be sustainable so that we can work on this equitable issues. And I think the reason that it's so powerful for us to surpass that million dollar in grant making to Southern Arizona organizations is because the need is still there. We need all hands on deck to be able to provide for our most vulnerable. And that's why we brought in Michael Soto from Equality Arizona to talk very specifically about uh, the policy uh, proposals that we have seen from various city councils to the state legislature that really dehumanize the LGBT community. And so despite our progress over the last you know, several decades, uh, arguably, we are still very much on the chopping block. And so Michael, uh, I'm not sure you know, how you uh, can summarize what is happening throughout this entire state, but give us a sense, please, a part uh, of why we are having this conversation today. I'm happy to. Um, I I can share some slides or I can just speak about it, whichever your folks would prefer. Um, but I think, you know, context is important and Arizona is always at sort of the tip of the spear when it comes to political change in this country. And that is both progressive and regressive political change. And so we have, we were the very first state that um, experienced bathroom laws, right? We were also the very first state to beat a uh, change to the state constitution that would have defined marriage as between one man and one woman. And so Arizona is a really fascinating state to do this kind of work. Um, <clears throat> what we're seeing across the country this year, um, we have seen unprecedented attacks on the LGBTQ community, um, specifically focusing on children, um, and even more specifically focusing on trans children. Um, and these are um, planned and coordinated uh, legislative and policy attacks, uh, many of them authored by the um, by the ADF um, that, for, that is located here um, in Scottsdale. They're actually headquartered here. Um, they're a recognized hate group um, by the Southern Poverty Law Center because of their targeting of LGBTQ people. Um, they are the authors of the trans athlete bans, right? They're the authors of the medical bans for transgender children. They were the lawyers that represented um, the Masterpiece Cake um, uh, shop case and were involved with Brush and Nib. Um, and so we have organized opposition um, that has actually disseminated these kinds of attacks in more than 33 states now. Um, Arizona is one of those states. We were actually one of two states that was the first to um, see a trans athlete ban, and that was last year, which we beat, which was great, um, probably in part due to COVID um, and the legislative session ending early. Um, but we beat it again this year as well, um, in large part because of our advocates and allies at the Capitol, like Representative Cano. Um, who are fighting this fight every single day. And so this, this session we have seen, um, we had 
<clears throat> more, I think we had eight original bills um, that targeted the LGBTQ community specifically um, in a negative way. We had many more that were positive um, that were not even brought to committees, unfortunately, because of the makeup of the legislature right now and the leadership of the legislature uh, not allowing those bills to be heard. Um, but we act actively fought eight original bills and then had to fight multiple times over because bills came back after they were beaten, um, specifically the sex education bill um, and the conversion therapy ban ban. Um, so it was a preemption um, on conversion therapy bans. <clears throat> that we had to fight three times. Um, and so what we've seen is that, and the legislative session still isn't over, right? And so we're still monitoring what's happening. Um, we're hoping, you know, as I'm sure the representative is as well, that the session will end soon. Um, but, you know, until it's over, we don't know what will come back, even in the budgeting process. And so um, this, you know, this session has been uh, kind of the epitome of the Wild West, I think, in many ways. And I'm sure the representative can agree. Um, but this is an unprecedented time in terms of our legislature and overall attacks on LGBTQ people through the legislative process. Um, we, you know, we luckily, though, have been able to make some strides in cities and towns and on the municipal level. Um, and so with our partners like One Community, in 90 days, we won three non-discrimination ordinances in three different cities. Um, and they were some of the most conservative cities in Arizona. So Mesa, Arizona was the first, um, and that is the most conservative mid-sized city in the country. Um, Scottsdale, Arizona after that, and then Glendale, Arizona. And so those three cities have been a pretty large tipping point in terms of restarting the municipal non-discrimination ordinance work um, because as you know tucson has had that uh that ordinance for a very long time um and now we're trying to get that going again specifically to build momentum for statewide policy hopefully in the future um and this has been you know this work has been absolutely incredible and possible in large part because of the large coalition building um, that a lot of organizations have done for many years. Um, I think a key part that uh, to our work, um, which unfortunately uh, hasn't made as much headway as we would like at the legislature, although it has been successful in defeating bad bills, because I think it's important that you know that every single anti-LGBTQ bill that was run this session was defeated. Um, and so not one passed, um, well, one passed, but the governor vetoed it. So not one became law. <laughs> and so um, that is very critical, um, although we still want to see um, at least a, enough of a shift that we can get some of the positive laws um, and policy looked at, hopefully in the next session. Um, and if not, then it'll have to wait until after the 2022 election. But um, we're hoping that building this momentum and folks seeing the strong bipartisan support, um, the city of Mesa, that ordinance passed, and then we defeated the Center for Arizona Policies referendum on that policy as well, with strong support from the Mormon Church. Um, from a, we have a faith leaders letter that has over 130 um, faith leaders in Arizona that have signed on to it. A business leaders letter that has hundreds of uh, business leaders that have signed on to that, including all of the major sports organizations in Arizona, many of the major corporations, and so we're really hoping that the the message that we're sending um, and building sort of from grassroots up um, is that LGBTQ equality is not a partisan issue. Um, it's only a partisan issue for a very extreme fringe of people. For most of us, LGBTQ people are a normal part of every family. Um, and in Arizona, that's it's very true. A lot of, you know, our families um, extend to to in to every walk of life right to every type of arizona and we live in we live in cities we live in rural towns and and small you know small uh, cities and communities um, throughout arizona we are of every ethnicity right we're of every socioeconomic class um, we're such a diverse population and we're doing our best to make that case from the ground up and have some amazing champions from every walk of life. Um, and so it's our hope that in the future, we're able to build that, not just that argument, but build those relationships with incoming politicians, um, with folks who are at every level of government so that they're ready to really 
engage in a way as people who are governing, um, engage in a way with the LGBTQ community that is in parity, in parity with and in equity with the way that they engage with every other constituency. Um, and at, at the core, that's our ask, right? Is just to treat us like every other Arizonan, um, ensure that we have the same opportunities um, and remove the barriers that are specific to our community um, that, that create great harm um, and create um, discrimination, create uh, exposure to extreme violence, right? All of these things, those are the things we want to end. And so our hope is that we're making headway on that. Um, it has been an unprecedented year, um, but I think that what we're seeing in Arizona, unlike other places even, even though we see a lot of these attacks first, um, we're consistently beating them and then winning good policy, which isn't happening in other places. And part of the reason why you're doing that is because we take this big tent approach and we try to depoliticize um, our lives, right? We try to just help people understand that LGBTQ people are just Arizonans who want to go about our lives like every other Arizonan. Um, and we think that message is working. Well, and we're so lucky to have Equality Arizona, Michael, leading the way, because I really do think what we've been trying to demonstrate throughout this entire process is that the need still exists, right? And the fact that in Arizona, you can still lose your job, lose your home, be denied public accommodations. The piecemeal approach is certainly building coalitions and the city to city perspective is helping. Uh, but really, uh, when you spoke of the grassroots, Michael, I think that's why we also brought uh, Lavina to be able to discuss Southern Arizona Senior Pride and tell us that kind of macro level perspective of the impact of policy and the reason why we still exist. And so Lavino, I rudely interrupted uh, your intro earlier. And so I think ultimately you can pick up where we were, but um, we'll also be happy to really start off into the why philanthropy still is so needed. Can you tell us, Lavina, a little bit about the folks that see the Southern Arizona Senior Pride uh, is seeing? I mean, we've, you've discussed key issues, uh, housing remaining a very, very critical issue, uh, Lavina. And so uh, I'll leave it up to you and to how you, what you would want us to take away from uh, the last half hour of conversation from both Kent, Michael, and now you. Thanks for being so gracious, Andres. I'm sorry that I misunderstood the uh, introduction. So let it's me right. go back. I'm Lavina Tomer, Executive Director of Southern Arizona Senior Pride, which is a grassroots organization that is on its way into being uh, its own 501c3 organization. And um, we just are hiring some staff. Uh, for the last seven years, we've really been running uh, with volunteers, who, very dedicated, committed volunteers, and which you know, we can identify as a grassroots organization. We've uh, slowly but surely have been building our reputation, our brand, um, our infrastructure, and of course our services and our outreach. So we're busy and we've gotten incredible support from the uh, Alliance Fund and we even get uh, grants from uh, a foundation called the Wild Beast Foundation, which is near Boston, Massachusetts. And um, also some other, like the Women's Foundation of Southern Arizona, the Community Foundation. So we've been quite fortunate in getting the support. Um, and I think that's because of the hard work we're doing and that a big effort is around visibility. And in talking to um, one of our new volunteers, his top priority is visibility because we're not visible enough. We're, they're, we figure that there are uh, over um, 50,000 older adults, uh, 60 and older in Southern Arizona. Well, we are seeing a small fraction of those people. And the people that we serve really benefit and appreciate what we're doing. And we want to really expand and broaden that outreach. We want to engage more people. 
uh, we will eventually be increasing our services, but, but at this point, sustaining the services we have and uh, um, at the same time, strengthening our infrastructure is more than enough work. Um, and we have great programs like our community cares program serves older adults who are isolated and or homebound. And we train our volunteers and we also do background checks on those volunteers who will visit people in their homes. But during COVID, everything's been on the telephone or Zoom. We're still doing telephone visits, but now we're starting to increase our home visits again. I can't tell you how important this program is. Uh, I don't even know how some people find us, but we have people who are so isolated and have compounding issues like mental illness or disability or um, economic situations that are really untenable that I, I can't even talk about it. It's so incredibly moving, the connection that we provide and all, it, we, we really um, are dedicated. Our volunteers are, are amazing people. Through this entire year and a half, people were calling recipients one, two, three times a week because the isolation was so much greater than usual. I mean, they couldn't get any services. There were no caregiving services, no home health services, no other uh, resource that were able to really go and, and help people. So we're very uh, proud of this program. We also have an advanced uh, medical care planning program and we've been doing a lot of work. The Lovell Foundation has been incredible for us uh, in supporting diversity in the community for end of life issues. And, and they, we are included in their uh, philanthropy. And we provide documents and we also educate and, and emphasize the importance of being prepared for when we cannot advocate for ourselves. We need a power of attorney, we need a living will. And, and th those are the two things that we uh, primarily focus on in that program. We have a book club, we have a speaker series, uh, we have, uh, a uh, brief support group and um, events. We just had our first in-person event at Himmel Park and uh, 48 people attended. That was nine to 10.30 in the morning. And people were, of course, were all just so eager and hungry for connection. Um, and it was a wonderful, wonderful event. And so we, at Senior Pride really focus on our culture and on our history, but also interrupting isolation. And our volunteer program provides people with connection, purpose, meaning. And so we're a, a community, we're a small community, but a powerful community. And I echo, uh, uh, Kent in that thank you very much for having us here and for your investment in uh, inclusion and equity for all minority communities. And today uh, during Pride Month, you're, you're hearing from us. And um, I think that collaboration has been something that is, has been important, I mean, we, uh, as an organization, have, are involved with the Elder Alliance, the End of Life Care Partnership, Pima Council on Aging, Southern Arizona AIDS Foundation, the Tucson Indian Center, the, uh, you know, the Dunbar. We, we are, are um, visible and yeah, we, we are, really are 
partnering and collaborating. And it, it's made a, a huge difference in the last five years. I mean, there are changes in policy, changes in the way surveys are written. Uh, people are, are seeing normalizing services for uh, LGBT people uh, more and more. And um, that's been happening, you know, here in our community on a local level, on a grassroots level and on a more formal level. Um, so we were making great strides and as always, there's an and but. You know, and I think that's true for all, all of the diverse communities that you will hear from. And, but we're, we're still in trouble. Um, some people will not get health care uh, because they are uncertain about the, the care they'll get, the reception they'll get, and, and uh, the quality of care that they'll get. Um, we're still working uh, with people who are very afraid to come out. We, have, we had a, a man in our community cares program who recently died. He was in his uh, mid nineties. He had never come out to his family. He had, you know, I don't, like I said, I don't know how some people find us, but they do. And um, we had to be really careful about what kind of messages we left on his phone, who we talked with in his family, all of those things. I mean, it's still, it's still happening. And um, I, I come across people all the time who will say, well, I'm not out at work. Don't, yeah, you know, you hear that. And, and, and so imagine people who are older who that was, their, that was their life, that was their reality across the board. They didn't say, I'm not out. They just were not out. They weren't out, you know, they came together in bars and homes in restaurants, coffee houses for community connection. But anything outside of that, you did not acknowledge anybody else outside those, those venues. So we're working with people who have experienced tremendous invisibility. And uh, the fallout from all of that is an inc just, I cannot uh, express you know, the level of isolation. There's isolation, but it's the internal isolation is like, I feel like I live with that internal isolation all of the time. I still have to measure, can I come out here? Can I, do I have to stay, you know, closeted? Do I say who I am authentically and be authentic or do I have to hide who I am? Well, it's and still happening. What's critical about that, Lavina, I think is, is the, 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 the need persist, but ultimately the sustainability of funding is that much more critical because those seniors that we're talking about need the investment in the long term. And I think Southern Arizona Senior Pride is a prime example of what good philanthropy can do. Granted, you are all volunteer right now. So even more kudos to you for being able to do that because right now what we need is to have more increased philanthropic dollars going toward your way so that you can make multi-year commitments and not have to do this, you know, year by year, what can we do now? The capacity is so critical. And, you know, you can't have a conversation, Lavina, Michael, Kent, uh, and welcome to Kristen, Lara, Lana, Lynn, and Sarah without talking about Southern Arizona and our rich history, Kent. You were around for uh, Wingspan, you led the organization and you've seen ultimately the numerous nonprofits that are now responding to transforming LGBT lives here in Southern Arizona. And so when we talk about sustainability, Kent, what is the message that you think you would take to the fundraisers on this call and how they can apply it back to their organizations? Yeah, I mean, it's a challenge. There's no doubt about it. Um, because we know that um, there's not enough dollars flowing um, to LGBTQ issues. Um, and the sustainability is an issue. Um, we programs like you know senior pride are because we have a 
a really hardworking, dedicated group of folks that have, are driving it, right? Um, but if we didn't have that, what would be available, right? So we are looking, I'm really dedicated to figuring out how we build queer infrastructure um, in this community. And some of that needs to be dedicated queer infrastructure, and some of it needs to be um, through partnerships with all of you that work in allied organizations. Um, and so, you know, that's things like, you know, um, I see Sarah. So, you know, Pima Council on Aging and Brenda with El Rio and lots of you that are embedding and building in queer infrastructure in your organizations to ensure that these services are going to continue and so that we are reaching more and more people. Um, so I, I think that the solution is around collaborations. It's around building upon uh, a queer infrastructure of, of organizations that are doing this work, but also making sure that our partner and allied organizations um, are really taking on this work as well. And, and Michael, you know, uh, you have a unique space because you're a statewide organization and really advocacy is, is your focus, but you do it because of the folks on this call and their organizations, the clients they see. I mean, what are you taking from this conversation today? Yeah, I, I think what I'm taking most from this conversation is just how great the need is, right? In Arizona, we have such an incredible LGBTQ community. I mean, I know that this is feels counterintuitive for a lot of folks. And every time I'm on a national call, I emphasize this, that Arizona actually has one of the largest per capita LGBTQ populations in the country. And in fact, we have a larger per capita uh, population than DC, New York, Chicago, and Silicon Valley. Um, and so that means that while, you know, while New York uh, may outnumber us person to person, we still have per capita more LGBTQ people. And we don't have the infrastructure that a place like New York City has, right? That the Bay Area has. And so, like Ken said, you know, uh, we, like Ken said, we need the, those philanthropic dollars, whether they're local dollars or whether we're bringing more national dollars and international dollars to Arizona. Um, and that's something that, you know, I'm beating the drum about constantly is that Arizona is a place where people should invest, whether you live here or not, because the Arizona LGBTQ community is a tipping point social change community here, right? We are actually the, the community right now that is actually allowing for open door conversations, right? We are actually the community that we're seeing that bridge being built around social and political and even economic issues because grandparents, parents, right, great grandparents, aunts and uncles, they're finding out that they have LGBTQ children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, right, they've got people in their family, even sisters and brothers, right, they're finding out more and more that they're actually a part of the LGBTQ community. And that shifts the way that people begin thinking um, about every issue in their life. And so we really are this really critical community but we need that support because folks like Lavina and her organization, right? They're not getting the kind of support that they need um, from, from so many because the entire LGBTQ community isn't getting enough support, right? We are, um, we are such a critical community and yet we're very underfunded. Um, but the important thing to know is that we still survive, right? We find a way to support one another. We always have, we have such strong, resilient bonds of community where we come together to support each other, to do that work and to make sure that we don't lose anyone. And I think COVID was a really important example of that. It was such a hard time, but also such a beautiful time to be a part of our community, seeing all of us come together, band together to pull resources, to pay bills for families and for individuals, right? To, to support people through so many different mechanisms. Um, some were connected to organizations and some just popped up in the community. And so, um, you know, this is an incredible community um, that is vital to the health and success and the future of Arizona. And I hope that the future holds uh, a lot more support and continues to see our community grow and thrive. 
Well, and Michael, I think what I'm hearing a lot um, is uh, the, the year round presence is going to become critical. I mean, we're celebrating a historic uh, LGBT Pride Month, and I think, you know, it's nice to get some normalcy back to uh, those uh, in Washington who are acknowledging our existence, right? And, and yeah. passing, um, you know, housing laws uh, ultimately that are inclusive, and the need becomes that much more critical. But, you know, it, 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 we're here beyond June, right? Uh, right. And, and I think, Lavina, uh, we are going to be going into the final 15 minutes of this conversation with an open Q&A and welcome Scott, Spencer, and Travis. And if I missed anyone, I'll do my best to go through the list. But Lavina, uh, what are you taking away uh, before we open it up for questions? I mean, you talked about, it, it's collaboration to me, education, which you're doing, but partnership, uh, and, and it's so critical. Yes. And um, I do just want to mention a partnership that we have with the University of Arizona, uh, the CIRO uh, department. They, they are helping us do an LGBTQI plus survey for older adults, 50 and older. And it will close in June and it's only for Pima County. And, um, we are incredibly excited about having any data because there's a dearth of data about our community. Um, and we need to have that data in order to show that we are here, we have needs and, and people are expressing themselves and participating in surveys so that we can do that. So I wanted to talk about that collaboration just a little bit, but I think that uh, may I go on, Andres? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, I just wanna say that it's obviously AFP and the people in AFP are invest invested in educating themselves about uh, diversity and inclusion and the possible next steps to action may include being more visible as welcoming organizations. Um, uh, if you go to our website, Southern S O A Z Senior Pride.org, we have um, how to be a welcoming organization a pamphlet on, on, on our website. Um, partner, partnering to assist with uh, outreach, fundraising, attending our open events like the park, the event in the park. At all allies, everyone's welcome to attend. Um, come and get to know us. Um, and diversifying, of course, uh, employees and volunteers in your organizations. And, and we're here to help, right? As, as I think the, the part of, of this panel is that um, the Alliance Fund, our incredible grantees, I mean, it's a shared Southern Arizona community. And uh, whether it's uh, bringing back our LGBTQ roundtable that some of you may remember that existed a couple of years ago. The Alliance Fund is bringing that back. We want to begin the shared partnerships, the dialogue that we are having uh, right now. And Lavina, before we go into anything else, did you, did, you, did you have a little bit more or are you good? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, um, thank you. And I do see that we have a hand raised by Julie. And so Julie, we'll go right in if it's a question specifically for one panelist or for just a general uh, question, please, um, now's your time. Uh, thanks so much, Andres. Um, so a couple things, you know, it's interesting. I'm, um, I run the, what used to be the Casa de la Luz Foundation. And so I work in end of life mainly. And uh, one comment to Lavina is, right, we we work together, but I didn't know about the community cares program. And I love that. And I think about like my, I have this sporty spice group of ladies that I play soccer and Frisbee with and like how many of them would be interested to do that sort of work, you know, where they're, they're checking in on folks. So my point being that I am part of your community and yet I don't know all about what's going on. And so how do we do a better job of engaging uh, me as an individual, right? And us as organizations. And then I wanna uh, just quickly speak to Michael's point about, um, you know, sort of how do we help people come out so that, uh, you know, 
the LGBTQ plus community becomes more normalized, more families are aware, more families are invested. And, and I don't know if there's almost like a train the trainer method, right? Or a mentor program or something like that, where whatever stage of life, whatever stage of a person's uh, journey in coming out, that they have some sort of resource or some sort of support. And so I would love to hear about if something like that exists. Thank you. It's such a great question. Um, so we actually, um, during the height of COVID um, and for most of the last year, had a joint program that Senior Pride was a part of, um, as well as Equality North Carolina, um, where we put together um, people of all generations. So we had a multi-generation um, call that would happen several times a month just to to do that kind of mentorship, right? To make it easier to come out, to share stories so that folks were sharing stories of what it was like, what it's like to be LGBTQ at different stages in life, um, at different times and today. Um, and that kind of mentorship was really important and really impactful for a lot of people. We had everyone from uh, parents um, of folks who were coming out um, on the call to people struggling to come out, right? And really, especially during COVID, facing a lot of obstacles with having to be perhaps home and closeted again um, as young people in college, perhaps, um, or young folks in their 20s. And so I think that's a, you know, that's a critical part of the work going forward and something that Equality Arizona is actually giving a lot of thought about is how do we create, um, as we come out of the pandemic, how do we create LGBT spaces where people can feel welcomed no matter what stage in life they're in, no matter if they're out or not, um, and have that kind of community connection so that they feel like they can come out and live authentically at any stage in life, um, because we know that that for in terms of social determinants of health is a massive factor for an individual and a community's health and well-being. Um, and then from a political strategy, coming out's always been a political strategy for the LGBTQ community, right? Um, it started way back <laughs> at the beginning of our, our movement. Um, we knew that coming out was part of, a key part of how we change people's hearts and minds. And so, you know, we're here to do that work with the community and we value our partners like Senior Pride um, in Southern Arizona. And I hope that we can foster some of those spaces as we come out of the pandemic together um, in, the, in the future. Um, we're in Phoenix. We just last night um, settled on a arrangement to start doing a monthly brunch. Um, and so I'm hoping that um, a monthly like community brunch, I'm hoping we could do a similar thing in Southern Arizona. Um, and so as soon as we get that figured out, I'll, I will make sure to make a big announcement and make sure that we're um, really creating that LGBT space that is welcoming for everyone. We look forward to the invite, uh, Michael, first round on you. Uh, and yes. we have a, uh, we do have a hand raised. I wanna thank, um, Gemma, Jess, and uh, Ms. Garza, and all of you for participating in this panel. I, I think that what you're seeing is that there are tools available and, and so much of this is, it can be as simple as inclusive language, uh, inclusive uh, employment practices, hiring, uh, diversity of boards, representation, that all matters, you know? And, and I think, you know, at the Alliance Fund, um, we're bringing back the term queer for good that was uh, mentioned as part of this panel. You know, some folks just don't actually know that uh, the LGBTQ plus IA community has uh, taken back the, the, the term queer, uh, right? Some of you may remember when it was um, not a very friendly term. We now own that at the Alliance Fund, we're queer, we're here to stay and we're queer for good, uh, especially with the nuance that our philanthropic dollars, thanks to our donors, uh, allow us to fund directly the core services that are critical to our grantees. Uh, and, and that's critical. So um, Keith, Ashley, I see your hand is up. Uh, and if there are any last minute questions, please throw them in. Otherwise we will be wrapping up shortly. Uh, thank you, Andres. You just actually started to answer a piece of my question. Um, so I'm asking this question from the perspective of people who may or may not be queer, but work for organizations that do not have a social services and especially not an LGBTQ focus. And I, I wanna circle back to a phrase that Kent shared, which was embedding queer infrastructure in organizations. 
And so my, I work for the Tucson Audubon Society, right? We're a conservation organization that connects people to nature through birds. How do you embed queer infrastructure in organizations that don't uh, have an obvious connection with LGBTQ issues? And Andres, you touched on a few ways you do that with the board and inclusive language, but I'd just love to hear other ideas that, that might uh, uh, you know, apply to everybody in AFP. Yeah, I'll uh, try that one. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, you know, because it's interesting, my background is social work. So of course, Keith, you know, I look at the lens through all the human service agencies, but I love that you're raising this issue, right? Because Audubon is, is an important organization and there are lots of queer uh, bird lovers, right? And uh, folks that are involved in environmental justice issues. So I, you know, you could do little things like how you, um, you know, some of your materials, can you create you know, some outreach on your website, you know, that uh, that specifically speaks to, you know, how the queer community can get involved. Little things like that that show that an organization is welcoming, it can be small, goes a long way. It really does. Um, people in the queer community look for safe spaces and we look for organizations that recognize that we exist. And I think this is true of many marginalized communities, right? Um, we want to see that there's some sort of recognition that um, we matter. And I don't mean like we're more important, but like that there's a space in the organization for us to get involved. And so I think it could be something on your website that identifies different, you know, com marginalized communities and the ways in which, um, you know, they can get involved or outreach or those sorts of things. Lavina, any last thoughts? Uh, yes, I, uh, to add uh, to what Kent said, I think that now we're all looking at our diversity statements and we're revamping um, diversity statements and that when we do that, we need to specifically and directly include LGBTQI plus uh, as a community that we don't discriminate against or that we welcome um, and, and that we welcome. And, uh, and I think that's really important. I, I, I realized that I'm gonna start in, uh, letting people know to ch any organization that I refer them to, we often vet them already, but that they go to their website and look at their diversity statement or anti-discrimination statement and look for that were mentioned. In, in, that we belong there, that we're welcomed, however, however it's uh, termed. So I think that that's really important too. Uh, I think all organizations can do that. Yeah, we're queer for good and, and here to stay, right, Michael? <laughs> yeah, and I, I just wanna say, I have to say this because I've gotten feedback on this from people who are older. They're very offended by the term queer. I am not, I use it, but we need to remember that we are in relationship with people who were damaged by that term. And although we're reclaiming it and we're happy for it, I mean, we used to say, I'm here, I'm queer, you know, that kind of stuff, or I'm queer, I'm here, whatever. But uh, we have to be, we have to be cognizant of that, I think. Absolutely. And you know, Michael, uh, I hate to do this, but you have shared a lot with us and I'm looking at time and I just really wanna thank our incredible uh, panel, Lavina, Michael, Kent, you all allowed us to have a critical conversation in the midst of Pride Month on this Friday with AFP. We look forward to returning to the new normal with all of you and your respective organizations. Um, to Keith and to Ori, uh, thank you for uh, this conversation. I hope you guys know has been months in the making. I think we started in February, really trying to figure out how to do this. Um, and Sarah, thank you for your leadership. Uh, we are here as a resource, as the Alliance Fund. It's an honor to uh, be the new leader of the organization, but really I think what you got from this is that we're in it together uh, and we're going to continue to create that historical uh, shift in uh, 
investing in the programs that are so critical to the upward mobility of our LGBTQIA plus community. So happy pride, Sarah, back to you. Thank you so much. Right. Andres, thank you so much. And I saw that you put your email in the chat feature. So um, if people want to follow up with, with you or support you in all of the ways, I think that that would be wonderful. And thank you everyone for joining. And I, this was absolutely wonderful. And I'm, I'm so proud of our fundraising community for, for this. And if anyone wants to stay, we're gonna officially end programming now. I know people have their nine o'clock meetings they need to get to, but I'll hang out for a few minutes if anyone has some questions about how they can get more involved with our local um, AFP chapter.